Good to go. Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. Today's Just Conversation is another in a series of conversations with members of a cohort of 12 scholars, faith leaders, artists, and activists who have come together in a project sponsored by the Henry Luce Foundation to reflect on religion and racial justice, expanding the moral imaginary through film, and to share their research and work. It is my pleasure to welcome to this conversation today a friend and colleague, Dr. Sama Shadare, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Ithaca College. There she teaches courses on religion, race, pop culture, and Islam. Her research looks at contemporary American Muslim cultural production, she is at work on her first book titled American Muslim Humor and the Politics of Secularity, which examines how Muslims have articulated themselves through the medium of stand-up comedy in the US. We will get more into that in a minute. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. Thank you for having me. Well, I want to jump right in. We cannot begin this conversation without somehow addressing the weekend's events and the incessant gun violence that is becoming almost normal in this country. This weekend in Texas, we had the 199th mass shooting with only 128 days into this year. So, Dr. Shadari, our cohort talks about expanding the moral imaginary. So I want to begin by asking you as a scholar, leader, researcher, what you think about the state of this nation's moral imaginary? Well, I'll start by, um, first of all, again, thank you for having me here. Um, and when it comes to thinking about questions about the state of our moral imaginary, um, it's hard not to feel devastated. Um, and think, you know, assume ourselves to be stuck in a mire, um, precisely because it seems, despite protests um, and, you know, cries out into what feels like an abyss, these types of things continue to happen over and over. And after a momentary outrage, it seems we always go back to business as usual. I don't think um, it's any surprise that the events of this weekend in Texas um, are coming on the heels of also gun violence in Serbia, where they had two mass shootings back to back. Um, and the fact that uh, there was a coronation in <laughs> taking place in London, um, a signal that the, the history of colonialism is not history and is not past, but alive and well and adorned in uh, the goal of, you know, the gold of stolen empires. Um, all of that is connected in a way that I think we need to pay attention to uh, and a recognition that these things, um, while colored by their specific contexts, are also transnational and interconnected. Uh, and that goes back to the ways that we think about violence and the ways that we deify violence and glorify certain, um, certain forms of it. Uh, I think someone who was really instructive for me um, in my own thinking about moral imaginaries is at Audre Lorde. And Audre Lorde has said famously, right, that difference is not something that we simply tolerate, but we need to be able to see it as the place where um, a creative dialectic can be sparked. Um, do we simply throw up our hands and say, this is the way things are? People are always going to just be this way. They're so different, there's nothing we can do. Or do we think there has to be some way um, that interdependency, thinking about different strengths, acknowledging ourselves as equals, um, with an attention to the ways that power is divvied up among us, um, can we in fact 
come to not necessarily even a solution right away, but an understanding that will lead towards our own collective liberation. And so that's where my thinking is right now on uh, the state of our moral imaginary. Um, and again, it's uh, it's hard not to feel devastated, but to use that, that devastation as fuel for something better. No, thank you for that. I love the way in which you've, in fact, contrasted, right? These quote unquote, two major events uh, of the weekend that has grabbed uh, the world's uh, attention, the coronation, right? And what that stands for historically, right? And then the violence that is also sweeping the globe and the way they're interrelated. And at least if we don't come up with answers, you know, we beg to at least know that there is a problem here and to begin to ask a different set of questions and to see how even uh, the coronation uh, that happened this weekend is a reflection of a history of violence uh, the, and how violence perpetuates uh, violence, right? And also a reflection of something else that has uh, emerged with vigor uh, in our nation, if not in, in globally and uh, across the world. And that is the reality of white Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, which in different parts of the globe, people might call popular uh, populism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so, while at least in our context, white Christian nationalism is not a new phenomenon, there are certain times when it explodes onto the public square with vigor. And we know that those times are often when uh, uh, white Christians feel they are under attack by non-white Christians. And so perhaps with the racial, cultural, uh, demographic shift, in our country and the decline in the white population while ra racial ethnic groups increase, we should have expected to see this explosion once again with violent intensity. Mm. Can you speak to this and what you find most challenging or not dangerous of this explosion? What impact this has on the work that you do? Absolutely. Well, you know, in fact, it was precisely these questions, uh, Dean, Dean Kelly, that you've brought up that led me to this very project that I'm working on. Um, I will say that we have these dramatic interruptions, these moments where, yes, something culminates in a January 6th or a Charlottesville. Um, but these things are constantly simmering. Um, and in the course of that simmering, the rest of us, right, are always there in the background. Um, I remember the first time I I read Stuart Hall, it felt like lightning struck mm. because suddenly there was a language and a vocabulary I could put to something that many of us have experienced, right, in, in that kettle where we watched the simmering take place on a day-to-day -day basis um, and unsure when it was going to explode into something. Um, when Stuart Hall writes, you know, that the, the, his famous quote, what what is it? The I'm the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea, the sugar from West Indian plantations, the, the tea from India and Sri Lanka, um, all of these important symbols of Englishness, right? Um, demonstrates that Englishness itself, whiteness itself, is deeply and unchangeably colonial in its contemporary imaginations. Um, and so that means that there is no whiteness, uh, there's no history of whiteness, there's no um, legacy of whiteness without also this history and this legacy of racism and racecraft um, and white supremacy. And so for me, I think that clarifies how deeply necessary, in fact, how colonized people and religion itself is really at the heart of these things that we see taking place today, which many would call deeply modern political issues, um, issues that take place perhaps uh, would have only been possible in a quote unquote secular world. Um, but how we arrived here is something that at least this gives us um, a more a clear direction of and, and more lessons to learn from. Yeah, and what you point to is the role that religion has often played, and I shouldn't say often played, has always played. There have been various uh, na religious narratives, but 
one that we know that has always uh, been prevailing is that there has always been this religious canopy, right? Mm -hmm. Over the kind of colonialism, over the kind of uh, supremacist whiteness, uh, the construct of whiteness itself, there's always been this religious canopy that has legitimized it. Again, almost nothing more, uh, no more stark reminder of that than the coronation right this weekend where church and 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 monarchy come together and they forge this sort of uh uh colonial kind of uh structure oftentimes as was the case uh this weekend and uh perhaps all of the time that religion has been christianity Right. And the ways in which Christianity has provided a sacred covering for white colonial uh, violence. How do we begin to interrupt that kind of Christian sort of narrative in supremacy? How do we move, for instance, in this country from uh, interfaith, interreligiously sort of uh, quote unquote, diverse nation to a nation that is actually interfaith and interreligiously just? Hmm. Uh, you're asking the real questions here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think a lot of the work is 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 doing what you've just done here, Dean Kelly, is, is naming it out loud um, because that's precisely where Christian supremacy and white supremacy um, gain their power is by virtue of operating um, in plain sight, right? So mm. much so that we don't even name them, so much that it is assumed to simply be the default. When we talk about religion, are we really talking about religion? at large, or are we talking about Christianity? Um, I think a, a perfect, you know, case study of this is the, the, uh, the backlash um, and, you know, outpouring of, of grief after um, overturning Roe v. Wade, um, and people pointing to, you know, in their, you know, a lot of folks minds on Twitter, that, you know, this is the, the culmination of, uh, of, you know, our, our secular society supposedly being taken over by, by religious fanatics. And yet, um, that is a disservice to thinking about even the ways that abortion is seen in other faith traditions. Um, those same things do not hold in um, traditional uh, Muslim views um, of abortion or in Jewish views of abortion. And yet, somehow, um, we've arrived in this place where Christianity equals religion and religion equals Christianity. So by naming it out loud um, and precisely naming it, right? Seeing where it is operative um, and where it is interacting with others, um, other traditions, other cultures, other contexts, um, how things change, but also stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, only then I think can we more accurately move forward with thinking about what a true diverse and justice oriented pluralistic future might look like. Yeah, what I like is you sort of flipped our gaze a little bit here because we often talk about the way in which these things function, if you will, sort of surreptitiously. Mm. And what you've caught our attention to is the way in which they actually function in plain sight. And as they do that, they become almost this routine, normal part, right? of our culture, uh, uh, of our gaze. And so that people almost naturally assume, oh yes, this is a Christian nation. And so mm -hmm. that, you know, anything else is outside of what it means to, to be an American, quote unquote, what it means to be a part of, of this nation and disrupts uh, the whole sense of, of, of nationhood, uh, uh, if you will, uh, and the way Christianity uh, provides a canopy for that, mm -hmm. uh, that, at least a prevailing narrative of Christianity. So you call out other Christians and uh, to, to show up and offer a different narrative. You, you want to comment? Yeah, I'll just say too that, you know, I think this brings us right back to, to Audre Lorde once more, and that is this notion of difference and being able to truly appreciate difference, um, acknowledge that actually difference is not something that keeps us from each other and divides us, but in fact can spark those connections that are needed 
to move towards a socially just future. Um, do we want to throw our hands up and, and you know, like enter a world of cultural relativism where we say, well, yes, some people are like this, you know, this religious tradition is like this, and there's nothing we can do to change it. Or do we stand firm and say, actually, no, there are some things that, you know, perhaps we don't align on, and we're still going to have to find a way to live together. I think by virtue of Christianity and whiteness kind of operating in plain sight, as you said, um, there's also an, an assimilationist kind of uh, weaponizing that happens through that, where um, if it is indeed operating in plain sight, if it is indeed operating as simply what it means to be American or to quote unquote fit in or to be secular, um, that means that other minoritized people must align themselves as well as they can with these dominating logics. Um, and so it looks like, I think, what um, many religious leaders have done in the past, where people will call to um, a shared history of Abrahamic faith as reason for, um, you know, uh, discriminating against LGBTQ folk, um, that this is not just something that perhaps Christians share, but they share with Jews and they share with Muslims. Uh, we share this you know, discriminatory outlook. It, and that is something that I would really push back on and say that it is very much not just okay, but deeply necessary for us to be able to say, no, there are other perspectives and interpretations here that have just as much place um, and don't need to assimilate in order to be heard and validated. Right. And what we can say is that we, uh, faith, traditions, religions share uh, an imaginary that pushes us toward toward justice, right? Mm. Uh, uh, and that perhaps critiques uh, some of these aspects of uh, all of our uh, traditions uh, in, in a different way. Which leads me, as you talk about this, and you had mentioned secularity uh, earlier, difference, uh, and the way in which differences and difference has become is weaponized uh, mm -hmm. in so many ways and, and e even criminalized, uh, right? right? Uh, so that uh, difference does uh, be, uh, become uh, uh, criminal uh, on, in certain contexts and certainly in the uh, context of white Christian nationalism. So your work, speaking of differences, on Muslim humor. Yes and the politics of secularity. Now, here's the thing, speaking of difference, oftentimes humor builds upon tropes and stereotypes and difference, and particularly of minoritized and marginalized groups, especially those groups of color. So how do you see Muslim humor functioning in this regard in terms of one, challenging those harmful stereotypes and tropes and expanding our moral imaginary and decriminalizing, if you will, uh, difference. Yeah, absolutely. So the this book project that I'm working on, as you as you named here, um, centers on both Muslim humor, but also just the idea of humor, how humor itself is this performance that we all embody um, that can be embodied uh, through the medium of stand-up comedy, but that humor itself is actually, I would argue, a central pillar of what uh, we would call secular modernity today. That secular modernity demands um, its citizens and its subjects to demonstrate humor. Um, and so I'm interested in the ways that Muslims have been constructed through this medium, um, but also the ways that humor too then gets weaponized as a way to assimilate um, and uh, tone down and tamp down difference. And I think bringing together Islam and humor um, at first sounds very disparate. Um, and it's precisely for that disparate reason that I think I wanted to jump on that association, right? The we assume that there's not necessarily a relationship between Muslims and humor, rather we think that there is a lack of a relationship. Um, and that relationship, right, especially in the last 40 some years, um, has been somehow made to feel, has been made to be natural mm -hmm. to Muslims, that Muslims are stoic, they're unfriendly, they're stubborn, they are quick to fly off the handle when you offend them, they can't take a joke, right? Um, and we have global flashpoints in our recent history that really undergird this assumption. Um, you had the Salman Rushdie affair in the 90s, 
the Danish cartoon controversy in 2005, the Charlie Hebdo shooting in 2015. Um, And so the debates that have followed this frequently um, have always boiled down to why is it that Muslims can't take a joke? And does this mean then that Muslims are not compatible with secular modernity? Mm -hmm. Um, And this is interesting to me because it seems that humor then is the axis on which all of this relies on. Um, We have responses to this question frequently where people are, um, as Toni Morrison famously says, you dredge up your own history to prove that you do have this, right? We have folks who say, well, look, we have instances throughout the Quran. We have documented references to the prophet Muhammad, all of these people as lighthearted jokesters, um, you know, who, uh, who have a levity that was meant to be emulated by Muslims. The fact that Muslims today are not emulating that means they've actually deviated from the, the correct way to be Muslim. Um, and still, I think we see people point to Muslim comedians, the emergence of Muslim comedians, especially in the United States, as proof that they are bringing together um, the, the freedoms that America enables um, through this uniquely American medium as well. But what my work is trying to articulate um, is thinking about how humor has become, in fact, that de facto principle of modernity, how we've made it out to be such an admirable like personality trait of a person so much so that we demand that they exhibit humor. Um, I think we will continue to come back to these like very doomed premises where we pit Islam against modernity or minoritized people against Um, you know, progress in the future. And we won't understand why we keep falling into these traps until we interrogate that premise. Um, So by centering humor, I think, um, seeing how minoritized Muslims both seize upon this notion that has been weaponized against them, how they then kind of embody that notion um, and then seek to find like social legibility through it is what I'm really interested in. Uh, Yeah, sounds like just saying Muslim humor, which to some is an oxymoron. It's right. Like, Precisely. Right, Muslim humor. So just saying Muslim humor, in fact, challenges a stereotype, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, about Muslims themselves and about the Islamic uh, faith tradition itself, and that it's a humorless uh, people, a a humorless, uh, if you will, tradition. And I always find these fascinating connections between humor and uh, religion, right? Because we laugh because there's such a discrepancy between what is and whatever it is uh, we're contrasting. And that makes us laugh. And that's to me what the religious is all about, the discrepancy between what is our present Mm -hmm. and what we know, right, is supposed to be. And so I always find this intrinsic connection between humor uh, and the religious and humor, uh, laughter uh, and, and the religious. Uh, let's let's keep along this uh, road as we wrap it up with this question. You and I are a part of of this cohort uh, that looks at film. Uh, uh, we've come together to learn through film. We've watched some provocative films. Uh, helping each of us to expand our understandings of various racial ethnic groups and cultural traditions. If not, I hope our our own moral imaginaries when it comes to indeed what justice looks like, not to speak of the growing awareness that at least I know I've walked away with about the role and power of film. In one sense, I think that as we are now again in this time where discussions of race and ethnicity are being banned from our classrooms, that we have to find new ways of changing the story for the next Mm. generation. What role do you see film playing in this regard or any other medium for that matter? Oh, absolutely. I, I love this question because it lets me bring up one of my favorite theorists once more, which is Stuart Hall, Um, and his own musings on the power of pop culture, um, precisely because it is this public archive that 
the people have access to, and the people will continue to have access to, you can't always, right, the powers that be cannot all ever entirely tamp down these conversations and the challenges that pop culture poses to the hegemonies and the powers that be. Um, film, I think, is going to continue to be an important way that we can continue to ask these questions. And indeed, the films that this cohort has screened have done that and have um, led to incredibly rich and challenging questions and conversations for all of us um, in the ways that these films either challenge hegemony or merely point them out, sometimes even champion them as well, vis-a-vis -vis different characters or perhaps the entire arc of the film. That, I think, allows any of us, right? Any of us who are inquisitive about moral imaginaries to think more precisely about power and how it is at play broadly. Um, and in that way, um, an individual film about an individual cultural context or historical moment becomes applicable to a whole range of places and people and ideas and thoughts, um, even the future. And so in that way, it enables us, I think, to think about futures that can be as opposed to the way that things are, as you noted before. So let's end with this question. If there was, we've viewed, I don't know, maybe 12 films uh, uh, this year. If there was one film that uh, you would want those who are joining us uh, live in this conversation to uh, watch and one thing from that film uh, that stuck out for you, what would that be as we try to move toward a more just? Mm. Oh gosh, I think I'd have to go to the very first film that we screened, which was Sankofa. And the I think perhaps it was because we were all in the same room together too, the experience of, of viewing something, consuming something um, with others as a shared experience is itself powerful in and of itself. Um, but the types of conversations that we had afterwards um, were really useful for me because suddenly I could, again, once more give a name to something I was feeling. There was, I think at one point we had discussed this, I had this lump in my um, in my chest that I could not untangle until we were able to talk about it together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those really, those affective moments um, and cultivating those affective moments, right? Where suddenly you are feeling something that you can't give a name to, um, that conversations with others enable you to unravel and understand. Um, that's the power of, of the moral imaginary. Um, and so I would in fact, encourage everybody listening here or watching this later on to, um, to stream that film, um, to get a sense of at least what it was like for all of us too in that moment. What a great place to end. Uh, the power of film in helping us to untangle that lump, as you say, that we all have, that the way in which we can come together and the effective, effective power of film. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sama Chaudhary, for being a part, not only of this conversation, but being a part of our conversations around film. Uh, that have expanded for all of us, uh, our moral imaginaries. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all for joining us.